I'm going to bring out Adam and Owen Gore, and I think they're going to walk you through uh, how this is going to work. Howdy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reef, and let's have a hand for Dr. Reef, who sponsored Right Club, uh, uh, Right uh, Writers Week, all these years. All right. So we've got a little musical improv, but we got to do a little prep for it. We thought it'd be fun. So we're combining the hero's journey, which may, maybe many of you have heard about in your English classes. We've got the hero's journey, you know, arc, conflict, loss, all that, uh, with Mad Libs. And then a little jazz thrown in, which is why Owen's up here. Um, so we're going to start with the Mad Libs portion of it. So I'm going to have Owen call on, call on you and give me the answers. And then we're going to write down your answers. And we're going to go backstage and put it together and then come back out and, and play and read the whole thing for you. So... Start off on our hero's journey, we need five different animals. Five different animals. So I'll call them out, give me the animals, I'm gonna write them down. A platypus. Cow. 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 Lion. I heard zebra, we're going with a safari theme. One more. Cockroach. All right. The much underappreciated cockroach. Next up on our hero's journey, uh, we need some type of vehicle. Any kind of vehicle. A Kia Soul. Extremely specific. All right, next up, something, and we need hands. Something that makes a loud noise. An item or a thing that makes a loud noise. Dr. Brown, I heard Dr. Brown. I'm writing that down. Next, I need you to put these three things in order for me. Put them in order for me, any order, so I'm just gonna call on one person. A mountain, a valley, and a river. Put them in any order you want, doesn't matter. Pick someone out, though. Mountain, valley, river, I don't care which order. Go, we gotta get the two truths people out here. Just those three things, in any order you want. River, valley, mountain, thank you. All right, we're gonna come back and we're gonna do a little musical improv and storytelling for you, but right now here's your two truths and a lie. All right, so for two truths and a lie, we have uh, Ms. Colombo, Mr. Murchison, and Ms. Tarzinski. Yeah. Oh, you guys know how this works. So you're going to hear three stories, and you're going to um, have an opportunity to ask questions after you hear all three stories, and then you'll vote on which teacher you think is lying. So there's two truths, one lie. And um, I just have to make sure that the first storyteller, Ms. Colombo, is ready to go. Miss Colombo, she's gonna go first. Sorry, I was rehearsing. <laughs> All right, as many people would claim that they grew up during the best era ever for music, but I actually did in the 90s. Sure, my parents had the Beach Boys, the Rolling Stones, and the Beatles in the 60s and 70s, but that was all rock. Growing up in the 90s, we had it all. Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, and Nirvana not only gave us great grunge anthems, but also an aesthetic. Flannels, ripped jeans, and Doc Martens. <laughs> 90s hip-hop gave us such legendary artists as Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, and Tupac. That's just the way it was. Things will never be the same. And who could forget the icons of 90s pop music? 
Michael Jackson, Britney Spears, and Mariah Carey. All I wanted for Christmas was a gift certificate to Tower Records. But I'm not here to discuss any of those groups, artists, or genres. I'm here to tell you all a tale related to the best music that came out of the 90s, country. I stumbled upon country music on a family vacation to the Southwest during spring break my sophomore year of high school. The radio stations out there offered scant selection, so by default we listened to country music for long stretches of the road trip. I returned to Chicago to discover that US 99 was playing all of those catchy tunes that I had enjoyed so much on vacation. So I dove headfirst into the genre, and before I knew it, my CD collection consisted of Shania Twain, George Strait, Alan Jackson, Reba McIntyre, and John Michael Montgomery, just to name a few. In my junior year, I was officially obsessed with country music. For my 16th birthday, all my girlfriends surprised me, blindfolded me, and drove me to the Allstate Arena for my very first concert ever with Brooks and Dunn. If you know, you know. But these guys had two of the most iconic 90s country hits, My Maria and Boot Scootin' Boogie. And I certainly did boot scoot it up for that milestone birthday. The interest level and devotion that I had to country music did not abate my senior year. In fact, it grew exponentially. I decided to go to college in Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, one of the places where I first encountered country music. The allure of the West was incredibly appealing to me, and I wanted it all. The music, the boots, the mountains, the cowboys. I could go on. So when my friends and I heard that the undisputed king of country music would be coming to town, I headed out post-haste to the local ticket master at the mall to score Garth Brooks tickets. I had to see him. He was the goat of country music. I knew all of his songs by heart and played his CDs in my car over and over again. So naturally, I was very disappointed to discover that the best tickets that we could afford on our meager teenage budgets were in the nosebleeds. However, I consoled myself with the fact that I would get to see Garth play live, and that was all that really mattered. The night of the concert finally arrived, and my girlfriends and I got all dolled up in our finest boots and jeans. We climbed to our seats in the sky at the United Center and settled in. The stage was so far away, though, and my sense of deep disappointment still lingered. How is this concert going to be any good? My friend Karen, the really pretty one of us, <laughs> went to go get some food and drinks, but she came back sooner than expected and without refreshments. She was talking incredibly fast and incoherently, and we couldn't follow her. Calming herself down, she told us the most mind-blowing news. She had caught the eye of one of Garth Brooks' hype men. He asked her how many people were in her party. She said six, and just like that, he pulled out six front row center stage tickets and told her to have fun. To say that we were shocked was an understatement. My heart felt like it would burst out of my chest. I couldn't breathe. We hustled our way out of the nosebleeds and onto the main floor with the confidence and panache that only teenagers who just scored the best seats in the house to the hottest ticket in town could pull off. We were escorted to, we were escorted to the front row and told to make Garth look good with a wink and a smile. Not long after, the lights went dim, the crowd roared, and a silhouetted cowboy with a guitar took center stage. It was Garth. He came over to the edge of the stage where my friends and I were awaiting him, strummed his guitar, lowered his voice, and started singing Rodeo. Recalling the words that were imparted upon us, we set out on our mission. We reached for him, kissed his boots, hugged his ankles, and just got really cozy with the man. We swarmed him every time he took center stage, and he even held my hand during unanswered prayers. This was all so surreal. Was I dreaming? I had lamented our original seats, but yet two hours later, I was holding the hand of my idol as he and the crowd belted out his hit. Karen had a disposable camera and caught the moment in a photo. And that, along with the front row ticket stuff, are tucked away in an album somewhere in my basement. The night I got up close and personal to Garth is perhaps one of the highlights of my teenage years. And now, as an adult, 
His lyrics remind me of a valuable life lesson. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Remember when you're talking to the man upstairs that just because he doesn't answer doesn't mean he don't care. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Oh, that was amazing. Uh, a lot of kids and even teachers are just so afraid to speak in front of a group and a push themselves into their, uh, a, a zone of discomfort like that. And I just admire you so much for telling a great story, but also singing in a beautiful moment. That was great. Thank you. Can we just give her a It's a great example of what the whole thing is all about. All right. And another treat for you is Miss Tarzinski telling her story. Yeah. So, when my daughter Eve Marie was six years old, she had a mischievous smile and a determined way about her. She was spunky, fun, and possessed a wide-eyed innocence. And of course, in my eyes, she was adorable. In fact, so adorable that about that time, mild anxiety began to grip me. Eve Marie had, and still has, a wanderlust, a desire to climb trees, to simply explore nature, and to do it unbridled. I love that about her but perhaps too many Criminal Minds shows had infected me with F. Scott Fitzgerald's hot whips of panic, a trepidation that my only child could be stolen from me, that she could be innocently lured away by the ruse of a lost dog or a hurt human. Up to this point, I had pretty much felt innocent, or excuse me, I had felt secure with the world, but now there was a paranoid terror if Eve Marie was two minutes late walking home from the bus stop or worse, if a man that we saw walking his dog in our local park looked just a bit too long at my daughter. That summer, when Eve Marie was six, we traveled through Florence, South Carolina on a family trip. It was 2016, June, and it hot. In the early mornings, though, when the heat was at its lowest, we traveled to see the natural outdoors. We drove to Timrod Park in Florence, where there were 18 acres worth of trails. The trails were gravelly with old maples and some oaks lining the pathways, relieving us from the 90 degree heat. The sunshine sparkled through the trees as we walked the trails, the old bendy trails twisting this way and that. We took selfies under the cooling trees next to the county bridge for our Christmas card with Eve Marie's hair shining in the sunlight. I don't think I've ever seen her with lighter hair than that summer a culmination of the pool's chlorine and sunlight brightening her hair to the color of Rumpelstiltskin's spun gold. In the middle of that Tuesday morning, there were hardly any people at Timrod. The sunlight was warm on our skin, and my husband and I relaxed on the double-wide throw and munched on Eve Marie's beloved breakfast snacks, apples, peaches, and a choco trail mix. Suddenly, Eve Marie got to her feet, as six-year-olds will do, excitedly speaking about a perfect tree to climb, and then dashed off. I sat up, too, anxious to follow her, but my husband put his hand on my arm, coaxing me back to relaxation. It's okay. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. Let her have some fun, some independence, he said. She wants to climb a tree. Let her. There's no one here. We made plans for the rest of our road trip, but fell into an argument about the times to drive to Tampa. 3 a.m. or 8 a.m.? Wake up crazy early or sleep in? and I suddenly got a nagging sense of time. How long had Eve Marie been gone? I'd never felt blood draining from my face before, but I know it now. Paul, where is she? How long has she been gone? I'll take a look for her. I'm sure she's around the bend, likely in a tree, he laughed. Now, anyone with a child knows this feeling of helplessness, a guilt of, 
what was I doing that I wasn't watching my precious child? The, I am the worst parent in the world that comes upon you. That fear, that panic, that, oh my God, what is happening to her? We hurriedly turned the bend on the path. No Eve Marie. We looked up at the trees. No Eve Marie. We called her name, walking off the path into cooling glades towards cave-like structures made out of vines and leaves and creepy Spanish moss. No Eve Marie. Our voices got louder, our wake, walking pace faster, our urgency stronger. No Eve Marie. I thought I was gonna vomit. Time was passing so quickly. I thought about that sunlight in her hair. It had been at least an hour. What would I do if I had really lost her? I looked at my phone. If I call 911, then I have to admit that I've lost my child, that I'm a terrible mother. How am I gonna be able to live with this, this shame? How could I live with the judgment of Paul's parents? And what if she was... In my panic, I fell to my knees. All of a sudden, I saw her through blurred vision, running down the path, her blonde hair waving behind her in the sunlight. At first, I thought it was a trick of the heat, the light, but then I don't think I've ever sprinted so fast in my life, finally scooping her up, telling her that I loved her, sobbing frantically, only to be hugged by my husband as well, like a family sandwich. We were all crying, my daughter in hysterics that she had worried us so much, me relieved that she was all right, fine, but still hiccuping with tears, and my husband beside himself with two weeping girls. Eve Marie had been climbing trees all right, but hadn't been able to get down when she heard us calling. She had climbed too high. Paul and I looked at each other quizzically. If it was too high to jump, how did she get down? Mommy, there was this nice older man on the path wearing a black baseball cap. He saw me that I wanted, he saw that I wanted to get down and he told me to jump and he would catch me and so I did and so he did. He twirled me around in a circle and asked me if I was lost. I said I didn't know if I was. And then he told me that I had the most beautiful golden hair. He touched it for a minute and then asked if I wanted to meet his puppy. I really wanted to. And he took my hand and we were walking towards a place that looked like leaf caves. He said his puppy was overheating and needed a place to cool down. He told me that I'd love his puppy and that I could play with it for such a long time, maybe even forever. But then I heard both of you crying, and that made me sad. So I just took off again. I know you don't like it when I do that. And I think I made the man angry. He started running after me with a mad face, but then stopped and ran away when he heard the two of you calling me. Can we go look for his puppy? For the second time that day, I felt the blood drain from my face. I turned away from them both and vomited. All right, we got one more story. One of these teachers is lying. You'll have to uh, use your skills and figure out who's lying. Come on up, Mr. Merchison. Hello. All right, uh, so. I'm uh, Mr. Murchison. If any of you guys uh, have, well, if any of you guys know me, you'll know that I'm a physics teacher here. And uh, if any of you guys have ever taken my physics class, uh, you'll probably know that being a physics teacher or being a teacher at all wasn't my uh, first career path. So I want to take a little bit to talk about that with you guys today. Um, See, after uh, high school, I, I want to be an engineer. I want to be an aerospace engineer. So I went down to school at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Um, yeah, ILL. Um, and uh, I, I went to school to become an aerospace engineer and build spaceship parts. Uh, and I did for a short amount of time anyway. Um, and if you have taken my class, you'll probably hear me talk about how I spent that short amount of time building spaceship parts for the U.S. government at uh, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. So that's, that's all true. I'm not, that is verifiable. Uh, you'll probably have to ask Dr. K to uh, bring up my resume somewhere, but it's, you, you can fact check that. That's true. Um, what I want to talk to you guys today is uh, how I got that job 
in the first place to begin with. Um, so I want to take you guys back to the spring of 2016, right? It's a tumultuous year. There's a controversial presidential election coming up. Uh, Britain just voted to leave the EU, uh, and somewhere in the Cincinnati Zoo, uh, an innocent gorilla was just killed, right? So, that's right. So, um, at this time, I was finishing my sophomore year of college, and I was hoping to apply for some summer internships, work at some engineering firms, give some experience that way. Um, so, it was a couple weeks before my spring semester finals in my sophomore year when a student group uh, that I was a part of, we had heard about this, um, this symposium, it was like a conference happening out in Washington, D.C., uh, just outside of D.C. Um, and at this conference, there were going to be all sorts of astrophysicists, spaceship engineers, uh, scientists from all over the world coming to present their findings. So we were engineering students. We thought, hey, this sounds like a really, really cool opportunity. Um, problem is, this was two weeks before our spring semester final exams. Conference was in the middle of the week. And like I said, I went to school at U of I down in Urbana-Champaign. And this was in Washington, D.C. on the East Coast. So, I mean, what's, what's the logical thing to do here, right? You know, maybe email your professors, get some extension on some work, book a flight out of O'Hare. Uh, sure, but um, I was a broke college student, so flight was completely out of the question. Um, and I was a broke engineering college student, uh, which means that I could not afford to miss more than a single day of class or else help fall hopelessly behind. Um, so uh, our resolution, it's a group of friends and I, decided to pack up my Toyota Camry and leave at 6 p.m. on a Wednesday night and drive 13 hours straight, no breaks, to Washington, D.C. So we did. Uh, and we quite literally pulled up to Capitol Hill, uh, parked my car, and I have a very vivid memory of walking out of my car uh, onto the National Lawn and promptly falling asleep on the grass in front of the Washington Monument <laughs> immediately after that. Um, so after our very patriotic power nap, um, that morning we, uh, we went to the conference, right? So I got to meet astronauts, engineers, um, you know, astrophysicists, people like literal Nobel laureates, right, were at this place. And I got to learn so much about um, space science, and physics, and engineering. It was, it was a phenomenal experience. Um, and by some stroke of absurd luck, I end up talking to this guy named Chris, okay? Um, and at the time, I thought Chris was just this engineer. He was like happy to talk to a college student and like do a little bit of networking. So he's chatting with me and he's interested in what classes I'm taking, what kind of projects I'm doing outside of school. Uh, and we had a great conversation. And he says like, hey, like, you know, I, I work at the center. Uh, if you're applying for anything, any jobs, um, here's my car, you know, shoot me an email and we'll see what I can do. So what I didn't realize at the time is this guy, and this name you're not going to know, his name is Chris Galise, and he was the director of NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, which means he was the boss of a 10,000-person government facility with world-renowned scientists and physicists and all sorts of different spaceship parts that were being built there. He was the actual just head, and I didn't even realize it. Um, until I was looking at his business card and said, director of the center. Um, so uh, I took his word for it. Uh, I went home, I finished up my classes for the semester, I shot him an email and say, hey, I'm looking for a job this summer, what do you got? Um, and he responded, like, immediately, within a day, and before I knew it, um, I was moving out to Washington, D.C. for that summer, I spent three months working for NASA, building spaceship parts. Then I came back to continue my college experience. The next summer, I did it again. I had a job, moved out east, worked for three months, came back to finish my senior year, and I had a pretty good thing going. Um, and then my senior year of college, my direct supervisor offered me a full-time position after I graduated to work for NASA. And as you can probably tell by the fact that I'm standing up here talking to you guys, I turned it down 
to become a high school physics teacher. Um, but we're, we're out of time, so I think that's a story for another day. All right, we are pressed for time a little bit, so we have just maybe a minute or two for questions and answers. So is there any questions for Ms. Colombo? You're trying to determine, is she telling the truth or is she stretching the truth a bit? Any questions? The window's closed and then questions for Ms. Colombo. All right, Ms. Tarzinski, any questions for Ms. Tarzinski? Go. Uh, how old is your daughter now? How old is she now? Yeah. She's 13 and in seventh grade. Yeah. Okay, and then another question for Ms. Tarzinski. Window's closed, we'll take one more for Ms. Tarzinski. Is there someone? Oh, back there, real loud. Oh, did she really put her put someone's boots in a concert? Oh, that's oh. yes. This is back to Ms. Colombo. Okay. <laughs> yes, I really touched Garth Brooks. In fact, I kissed his boots. <laughs> how about Mr. Murchison? Any questions for him? Do you want to just pick someone? Uh, it's a bit of a long story. Take my class and I'll tell you. <laughs> is there another hand up back there for Mr. Murchison? Go ahead, real loud. My question is for Mr. Murchison. Are you sure you ever worked at NASA? Am I sure? Yes, I'm sure. I have a shirt. Do you not see it? All right, we're going to bring out the gores in a minute. Before we do that, let's vote. If you think Ms. Colombo is our liar, start making noise. Right. How many of you think Ms. Tarzinski is our liar? And how about Mr. Murchison? It sounded to me like the room kind of feels Ms. Tarzinski is the one that might be uh, stretching the truth a bit. So would our liar please stand up? Thank you. All right, now remember these guys just, uh, while this was going on, put together an improv. All right, let's see what they came up with. We need, a, we need a special guest for this one because we had such great suggestions from our Mad Libs portion. As you know, the hero's journey has been portrayed by numerous great authors over the years, Homer, Shakespeare, even Lion King, uh, we chose to do a paraphrase of the wonderful work by P.D. Eastman called Are You My Mother? So, uh, you will hear Owen providing us with themes for all of the different encounters that, that are had along our hero's journey here, and you'll hopefully recognize all of your wonderful contributions, sorry, wonderful contributions along the way. All right, we'll see how it fits in, but he, uh, it's gonna be a little bit of improv. He's got a couple of cues up here, but we basically went back there and made up um, all the little musical cues to go along with it. So here we go, with apologies to Mr. P.D. Eastman. Where is my mother? One fine morning, a mother platypus was taking care of her baby platypus. The baby platypus cried because it was hungry. Then he decided to take a little nap. All right, so the mama platypus left their home to go find some tasty food. The baby platypus woke up. Where is my mother, he said. He looked down but did not see her. He looked up, but did not see her. I cannot find my mother, he said, so I will go and look for her. And away he went. He did not know what his mother looked like, so he walked right by her as she was getting some food. He came 
to a zebra. Are you my mother, he asked. No, said the zebra. You are not my mother, he said, and he walked on. He came to a flowing river. Next, he came upon a lion. Are you my mother, he asked. But the lion just looked at him. You are not my mother, he said. And he walked on. He walked down a valley. Until he came to a hippo. Are you my mother, he asked. No, said the hippo. I am not your mother. I am a hippo. The zebra was not his mother. The lion was not his mother. The hippo was not his mother. So the baby platypus walked on. He walked up a hill. Until he came to a cockroach. Are you my mother, he asked. How could I be your mother? I am a cockroach. Do I even have a mother, said the baby platypus. He knew he did, and he had to find her. Now he did not walk, he ran. Now he ran past a Kia Soul. <laughs> that is not my mother, he said. So on he ran. Then he saw Dr. Brown. This must be his mother at last. Are you my mother, he asked. Yeehaw, said the Dr. Brown. The baby platypus was so scared, he ran away as fast as his little legs would take him. He ran so fast, he didn't even see his mother and ran right into her. Do you know who I am? Said the mama platypus. Yes, I know who you are, said the baby platypus. You are not. A zebra. You are not a lion. You are not a hippo. You are not a cockroach. Or a Kia Soul. Or a big scary Dr. Brown. Yeehaw! <laughs> you are a platypus. And you are my mother. The end. <laughs> Special thanks to Dr. Brown for being willing to be a caricature of himself. it might be fun if we uh, give these folks an opportunity to answer any questions you might have about what they just did for us. Uh, questions maybe what was the hardest part or how they come up with their ideas or any other questions you might have for these folks. So anyone have any questions? Yeah, right up front here. Go ahead. Which idea did you hate the most? What's that? Which idea did you hate the most? I'll leave that to Owen since I just had to say the words. He can't, had to come up with the the musical ideas to go behind all of them. Uh, I don't. I don't really think I hated any of them. Uh, the only one that was kind of uh, 
a, a struggle. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say a struggle, but um, the Kia Soul. I was hoping for. I was I was kind of hoping for something a, a little bit uh, larger um, that I could like that the uh, horn noise would fit more. But um, I don't think there's anything that was really too challenging. All right. Any other questions for the for our, yes? Go ahead, Wayne, back there. Um, well, that, that's a bass. I, I do also play, I do also play the cello and have been playing for like 11, 12 years, but, um, I've been playing bass for five years, I think. Uh, all right, 11 or 12 years, that's great. Yes, in the back. Yeah, a little louder. Dr. Brown said, yeehaw. Yeah. I grabbed Dr. Brown and said, hey, we need your help. Say something that Dr. Brown would say. And he said, all right, I'll say, yeehaw. I said, perfect. <laughs> all right, is Dr. Brown around? I thought it was great the way he helped out Miss Colombo to help you guys out. Where, oh yeah, let's give him a special recognition. <laughs> Just doing what he does, making things a little bit better in any way he can. He's awesome. Any other questions for these folks about what they did today? Yes? What part of your story was a lie? Oh, that's a good question. Which portion? Well, I have a daughter, so and she's in seventh grade. We've never been to South Carolina, so anything from there on out is just a total lie. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're relieved over here to hear that. What's that? They're relieved over here. Good, they were yes. worried it was true. Although, although I'll tell you that I am paranoid that she's going to be taken. That is true. Um, but I, that, that all just never happened. So. Great question. Any other questions for our presenters? Uh, so I've got a question for you guys. What was most rewarding about participating today? Um, getting out of my comfort zone. Maybe you know me, I'm a Spanish teacher, you might not think I can do anything else, but I, I do really enjoy writing. And um, I just decided to sing when that lyric came to me and I recruited my buen amigo, Dr. Brown, um, who willingly and happily jumped in and helped me get through that. So I'm happy I did it. I just like writing. Um, I enjoy it a lot, and it's kind of therapeutic, and um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in my head, so this is what happens. Um, so it's just, it's fun to craft the sentences. It's fun to speak it out loud. It's fun to, for me to hear it um, and see if it has an impact. Um, so it's a little, th a little theatrical. I like that too. I don't often get to speak into a microphone. This is like my, my one opportunity a year. <laughs> well, this is the fourth time I've got to do this and I, I've done something different every time and it's a blast and the, the English department here does such a cool job with this and so many different ways to be a writer, whether it's coming up with your own stories or sharing your poetry or songs or something like that. And I've been really, uh, it's been really fun to do that together and to do it alongside my kids pretty cool too. So it's been a lot of fun. Our English department does a great job and shout out again to Dr. Reef. Um, I always, I always enjoy performing. Um, and this is something that I've never really done before. Uh, it's very different than any other sort of performing I've done, and it's especially cool to be able to do it with my dad. So, yeah. Oh, nice.